I know morels are, are like the mushroom that a lot of foragers who are looking for. It's really prized. They taste amazing. They look really cool. Do you well, have any you've tips? Got the, you've got the, the fire morels clip there. And I think that's a, that's a, a good, you know, quick way to look at the concept of, of hunting fire morels. You can see the steam rising off the burned logs. This is where the morels, when it's wet and snowy, the snow melts first here, right off the burned wood. And so this becomes a little waterfall or a seep. And the morels grow in here in order to expand without using their, uh, making a, a, an actual fruiting body. The morels make these microscopic uh, structures. They make uh, clones of themselves, uh, little spores that are the same organism, and those are released in the water. And so that's how those, the spores and then the mycelium travel all up and down the hill. You'll often find, you know, uh, patches of this well-developed stuff, and then down downhill you'll find real morels. But this, what happened here? Once conditions changed really fast, it went from being a very, uh, you know, good and fast growing type of situation. And it might have gotten, we had some 80 degree weather. So that would be what my inclination is that this, you know, we got the hot spell and that dried it up real quick. Pretty nice. Pretty nice little stretch of habitat here. Uh, check this out. quite a few just right in here picked a few already I guess nice clumps okay so people want to see what it looks like before before you come and pick a bunch of morels well there's a bunch of morels there. Uh, here. There's a few mushrooms in there. Yeah, what a difference a month makes. When you look around here, you see that it's uh, about the same ecosystem we were seeing with the black morels, but it's a month later and it's considerably drier. Take a look at this. Pretty dusty. So, um, I've been doing this pretty much every, every spring for 30 years. You know, I, I'm out in the burn. Mm -hmm. Um, I usually run a crew of people, um, everybody, you know, there's nothing more ridiculous than saying that a mushroom picker works for you. Um, it's like herding cats. There's a, I, I managed to buy a few morels from a few, uh, a few individuals now and then, but, um, it's a, it's an interesting game, um, we range all over Can the U S and Canada, uh, been up to Alaska. Um, and I've also been working, uh, with Todd Osmondson, who's, uh, with, uh, Tom Volk up in La Crosse. Um, and Todd and I have been, uh, collecting a database of morels from different burn sites around the, uh, country and around the world, uh, we have natural morels from places as far away as uh, Argentina and Russia and China. Uh, and then we have uh, probably well over a hundred uh, different 
burn site locations over the last uh, 30 years when I've been, every time I go to a fire, I get so I get a few mushrooms for science and then I get mushrooms to eat and so forth and so on. And so I've been able to make a pretty extensive collections of uh, fire morels over a different uh, locations and seasons. So um, we're working on it. You know, the, the identity of what we call a morel is still uh, doesn't have a real distinct edge. We're still uh, looking at uh, trying to understand whether we're looking at individuals or populations. Are we looking at a population of morels or are we looking at individual morels? And so far we haven't had really good, we haven't really got, we can't really predict that. How many year, is it the next season after fire that morels pop up or is it two years later or, you know, when should people look for morels post fire? It seems to suggest that there are multiple species or maybe multiple individuals of morels that show up after a fire and that the morels that show up longer than one year after a fire are not the same genetic individuals as those that fruit the season after the immediate season after the fire. Um, Fascinating. Yeah. The, it, 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 it becomes difficult to talk about because I have to really pick my words and you can't really make a lot of generalizations, but we're seeing different populations of morels uh, not displayed over a broad geographic area, more like we see isolated populations in a mosaic pattern. And like, think more like a checkerboard over a hundred acres and then that same expanded pattern over a thousand acres and over a million acres as opposed to like where you have one side of the divide is ponderosa pine and one side of the divide is douglas fir okay so there's you have a very different sort of uh population distribution and so again are we looking at populations of populations or are we po looking at populations of individuals? And that's, that's kind of a, a, a weird thing to think about, but we don't know uh, how much diversity an individual can display. Are we looking at the diversity of an entire population or are we simply looking at one really rowdy mushroom? Right. It, so there's a there's a toxin in morel that a lot of people suggest you have to cook out and it's volatile so you can cook it out and it just evaporates out um and if you eat it raw or don't cook it enough um or stand over it while it's cooking and and huff the fumes you'll get sick i and then there's certain individuals it's rare that even if you cook it really 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 well um, you'll still get a little stomach ache and, uh, specifically for morels and like there's specific mushrooms that just don't work well for some people. I'm one of those people that morels, unfortunately, every single time that I have them, even just a small amount, and I've tried to cook the shit out of them, I get upset stomach and, uh, it sucks. So I, I give it away to other people. They're still really fun to find. And morels are really interesting for me. I always find them when I give up. 